So we'll be starting in a couple minutes and thank you everyone for joining uh, to celebrate, help celebrate our Americans with Disabilities Act 30 years. Very excited to, to, to be here after lots of challenges for, for the whole disability community. I wanted to point your attention to the Q&A uh, at the bottom. Uh, we'll be monitoring the Q&A, uh, obviously throughout. Uh, for those of you who are watching this on Facebook, you will be able to submit your questions um, and they'll be relayed to me. Uh, those who are on the Zoom webinar with us, you can again, uh, either type your questions in the Q&A um, or you can also um, hit the raise your hand button and we will um, be able to receive some questions live. So we'll do that uh, various, uh, various times throughout the webinar to get um, all of you involved in it. There'll be a lot of great questions uh, that will surely come up from all the great content that we'll be hearing. So um, let me just start with some of the intros. Um, but a lot of the, we have very many advocates that we'll be highlighting throughout this webinar um, uh, that we'll be introducing the presenters as well. But I just wanted to say, um, um, Jim Wiseman is our president and CEO of United Spinal. Dave Kaposi, formerly executive director of the Access Board. We're so happy to, to, to see that he's joined us as a, a board of directors, member of United Spinal. So thank you, David. Um, and we'll be sharing some other great videos as we go along. Um, and I wanted to say right off the top, um, uh, let's let's thank our sponsors. So um, Angel, if you wouldn't mind sharing that link uh, to, to thank all of our sponsors for allowing us to put on uh, this virtual advocacy series, which is the three part, the third part in the series. So thank you so much. Um, as you can see, we have Genentech there and Hollister and Verizon and many, many others. Um, um, and I wanted to also draw attention to Alaska Airlines, where we're, they are a proud supporter of United Spinal Association's virtual advocacy series. And there are two round trip tickets, uh, Alaska Airlines tickets that are valid for one year, which, be, which will be awarded to a randomly selected attendee of this, of this webinar. <laughs> and we'll announce the winner at the end of the webinar. So look forward to seeing that. And uh, that's something that you can look forward to. And um, I really wanted to start off with um, uh, a video that United Spinal put together around the 30th anniversary of the American Disabilities Act. So many of us across the country have worked so hard to get where we are. And uh, we're just going to play to start off with the first part of it, and you'll be seeing portions of it throughout the webinar. And we'll also be sprinkling in some shorter videos from advocates from across the country about what the ADA means to them. So why don't we start off with the first part, Angel? Thank you so much. Millennia, people with disabilities were warehoused and ignored. They lived in people's basements or attics or back rooms, and people took care of uncle so-and-so or aunt so-and-so, but they were not gainfully employed. No one expected people with disabilities to be gainfully employed. The World War II veterans who founded this organization did not want that kind of a life. came home from war or when people were disabled congenitally or traumatically, there was not a community support system to keep them living well in the community. 
organized groups of people with disabilities, including paralyzed veterans, made the need clear to government and expected government to respond. As United Spinal built its reputation, the organization's mission was galvanized by a new leader, James J. Peters, a civil engineer and second lieutenant in the U.S. Army who was spinal cord injured in 1967. Peters exposed the harsh conditions facing paralyzed Vietnam veterans at the Bronx VA Hospital in a Life magazine cover story. The report caused public outrage, which led the VA to begin to address the needs of paralyzed veterans. Within 10 years, the hospital was renovated and later named in honor of Peters. Jim Peters cared about the person with a disability. If you had a disability, he'd try to find a job for you. He'd create a job for you if you didn't have one. If you came with a systemic problem, he'd call the staff together and try to change the systemic problem and couldn't believe that you couldn't fix it. Once it was on his radar, it, you had to solve this problem. And many problems were solved that way because he just wouldn't take no for an answer. Hi. I'm Karen Roy from Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and I'm the brand ambassador for New Motion. And I wanted to talk about the Americans with Disabilities Act and what that's meant in my life. I was shot in an armed robbery in 1987, which left me paralyzed from the waist down. And I went back to college, and the college had very few accommodations for persons with disabilities. They had boards over steps with really steep inclines. There were no automatic doors. There were a lot of classrooms upstairs, and when you asked for the classroom to be moved, people were annoyed. Um, and that all started to change after 1990, when the Americans with Disabilities Act was signed into law. There was a lot of advocacy that went paved the road to getting that law signed in. Um, and I'm so thankful for all of the advocates that really poured their heart and soul and put their lives out there to make sure that we all have better access to employment and housing and education today. Great. Um, yes, it makes you think back to um, the beginning of all of this. As you think about what we've accomplished. That was Karen, uh, our chapter advocacy rep for Louisiana, Karen Rory. And I'm going to hand it over to Jose Hernandez, who is our president of our New York City chapter. Um, and he gets the honor to introduce our, our next guest. Um, so, Jose, over to you. How you doing? Um, as Alex said, I'm Jose Hernandez. And if you can't tell, I was the one in the beginning of the video driving the van. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm the New York City Advocacy Coordinator for United Spinal Association, and I'm also the president of the New York City chapter. Um, I was injured roughly 25 years ago and uh, five years after the signing of the ADA. Um, at the time, you didn't feel the ADA as much as you do now. Um, 25 years later and 30 years after the signing of the Americas with Disabilities Act, you can see its effects everywhere. You know, you can go down the street and point at ramps and, um, Someone is at the front door. sorry about that. <laughs> the challenges <laughs> of a virtual world, Jose. Oh, absolutely. Um, you can go down the street and point at a ramp and you know that you have access. And that's what the Americas with Disabilities Act has done for us, has made, um, society more inclusive of individuals with disabilities. And although, you know, a lot has been accomplished, a lot more needs to be done. And, you know, we celebrate the 30th year of the anniversary of the signing of the ADA. And I wanna continue the progress. Um, I just wanna point out that um, the coronavirus has set back the ADA a little bit, you know, uh, the transportation here in New York City was set for a big revamp. Um, and the coronavirus has put that on hold and hopefully through using the ADA and advocates, we can restart those advocacy efforts. 
So now it's my pleasure to introduce um, our president and CEO, Jim Weissman. Jim, James Weissman was general counsel for United Spinal Association for over 40 years and became president and chief executive officer in July of 2015. Weissman is a recognized expert on disability. He has led efforts on public transit and taxi cab accessibility in New York City and other major cities. Weitzman was a key narrator of Congress in drafting the uh, and achieving the passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act and authored the transportation provision in the law. In July 1995, he became a founding member of the board, uh, also American Association of People with Disabilities Board of Directors and in 2003 was elected uh, board chair. He earned his law degree from Seton Hall University Law School and is routinely consulted by people with disabilities, advocates, attorneys, employers, and transit uh, operators who wish to employ or provide services to people with disabilities. And before I hand it over to you, um, I wanted to say one thing. Um, when you did the lawsuit against the MTA, you should have gotten um, them to agree to the limousines. I would have loved to come to work in a limousine. And I'll let you tell that joke. So here we are, Jim Weissman, our president and CEO. Thank you, Jose, and thank you, everybody. Um, I have a PowerPoint, there we go. I have a PowerPoint, I'm gonna be saying next slide to Angel, next slide. So in the beginning, there was darkness. We're going to talk about ADA, but ADA is all wrapped up in pre-ADA advocacy. Um, lots of the advocacy was around transportation. There was no curb ramps, no transportation, no housing. Um, there wasn't much. Even calling a meeting of disabled people took forever to get the word out to arrange transportation to get together. There were no Zoom calls, et cetera. Um, but somehow people with disabilities were organized. Then there were deinstitutionalization and benefits. Next slide. That's Willowbrook, an institution in Staten Island where developmentally disabled people were warehoused. Um, these things were exposed. People began living in the community with disabilities. Physically disabled people were warehoused as well or were supported by family members to live at home. Um, they got out of the facility. There were subsidies created to keep them living in the community, but work didn't happen because people needed healthcare and healthcare depended on, as it still does in many cases, poverty. Next slide, please. There were some fits and starts of uh, civil rights laws on the federal level. The Architectural Barriers Act of 68, which was largely ignored, required federal buildings built or renovated to be accessible. Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act prohibited discrimination by recipients of federal financial assistance like state and local governments, but um, nobody even knew what discrimination was. For example, unnecessarily special treatment for people with disabilities wouldn't be defined as a discriminatory practice. But 504 created the concept of reasonable accommodation. And we'll get back to that in a minute. And the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, originally called the Education for All Handicapped Children's Act, passed in 1975. Next slide, please. The deinstitutionalization movement, uh, next slide, sorry. The deinstitutionalization movement put people in the community. And once people with disabilities were living in the community, their transportation needs became apparent and were acute. In addition to that, elderly, and elderly people had trouble 
traveling as well, who did not define themselves as disabled, uh, but had obvious mobility limitations. Um, Congress required transit agencies that took federal financial assistance to offer half fare to people with disabilities and make special efforts for people with disabilities which were undefined at times or required you to buy lift equipped buses at times or required you to provide paratransit at times or a mix of the services at times, but nothing was enforced with special efforts language. Next slide, please. Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act prohibited discrimination by recipients of federal financial assistance. It passed in 74, reasonable accommodation regulations were adopted by HEW in 77, which required accommodation and created that concept in people's heads for the first time in state and local government. And in 1979, a remarkable regulation was issued by Neil Goldschmidt, former mayor of Portland, current secretary of transportation, or then Secretary of Transportation, who had a relationship with his disability community in Portland, knew about lifts on buses. They put out, they required recipients of federal financial assistance to put lifts on buses until half were accessible, to provide key station access and to provide paratransit until that was done. Next slide, please. In 1979, that regulation came out and was effective in a few months. Prior to that, New York City's Transit Authority ordered 900 inaccessible buses after the regulation was issued, but before it became effective. 300, uh, three times more than their biggest ever purchase to load up on inaccessible equipment before the regulation became effective. Um, we sued uh, United Spinal, then called Eastern Paralyzed Veterans Association, <clears throat> sued New York City. These are three other suits we brought on mass transit prior to the passage of the ADA, which definitely affected the provisions of the ADA. Next slide, please. I'll tell you about them in a little bit. Next slide, please. Uh, by the way, I'm, I'm going to talk about the New York City experience. That is me in a younger day on the left of your screen. Um, holding up a rudimentary map of New York City at a press conference. That's Terry Moakley in the middle, a quadriplegic Marine Corps veteran who was a transportation advocate and passed away a few years ago. And that's Denise McQuaid, who actually blocked buses and was arrested, uh, who is currently, we were paralyzed veterans then, so she was not a board member or a member. She was just a disability community member that we worked with. But she has been on our board of directors ever since we opened our doors to the public and is still a very active part of the United Spinal community. Next slide. So New York City couldn't use Section 504. New York City advocates couldn't use Section 504. So. We used two New York state laws previously unused for something like this. The public buildings law that required transit and stations to be made accessible when they were newly built or renovated. But it described public buildings as including transit stations, but then went on to say buildings likely to be used by the handicapped. And the, the another, so buildings likely to be used by the handicapped including transportation stations had to be made accessible. And the human rights law, which said that state agencies couldn't discriminate against people with disabilities. Next slide, please. Our argument was that when you buy a bus, you're acting as this transit authority. And when you renovated a station, you're acting. If you're acting, you have to act in a non-discriminatory way. These people were acting, this is a, a demonstration in Philadelphia against SEPTA buses. Um, ADAPT was very, very active around the United States during this time. ADAPT originally stood for uh, Americans Disabled for Accessible Public Transportation when they started. And they, 
generated so much heat that people had to pay attention. Next slide. There's a wheelchair on the tracks. Is the, the reason I have those words there is that is the words that were in a New York Times editorial opposing transportation access when we obtained an injunction stopping subway station renovation unless the renovation included elevators or other level change mechanisms like ramps. No media agreed with United's final when, or EPVA we were then, when we brought the suit against New York City. Not one editorial board agreed with us. There was one city council person out of 51 in New York City, all of whom were Democrats at the time, by the way, one city council person supported us. One New York State Assemblyman supported, supported us and two New York State Senators when we brought the lawsuit. Out of hundreds of elected officials, uh, so many media outlets, every editorial board opposed us. But the disability community in New York City, which included disabled Vietnam veterans, who for the first time worked with the non-veteran disabled community, saw this as a statement about the ultimate worth of accommodating disabled people to society. Blind people who ride New York City subways every day started coming to our meetings because they were furious with politicians' attitudes towards disability. By the way, the New York Times opposed the Americans with Disabilities Act. Just, that's 1990. We're not talking about ancient history. And they were, were and are a liberal newspaper. So we had to create a new consciousness about the needs and rights of people with disabilities. Uh, next slide, please. This is the signing of the deal on transit. This is in Grand Central Station. That's Governor Mario Cuomo signing. Ed Koch, who opposed accessible transit to the right, the mayor of New York City, standing right, and Jim Peters, who was in the movie earlier, um, sitting next to Mario Cuomo. He was one of the plaintiffs in the uh, lawsuit. Um, this was a red light of day for us. This was five years of litigation. We went from being pariahs to mainstream, from being outsiders to on the inside. This is late 1984. We got lifts on buses, key subway stations, and paratransit. But not paratransit until the other stuff happens. Paratransit for anyone who needed it, much like what the ADA says now. Um, next slide, please. Next slide, please. So during this period when the, the New York City is litigating, the federal government has this Section 504 regulation, which requires lifts on buses until half the fleet is accessible. Transit agencies and their lobbying group sued the United States Department of Transportation to stop it, saying the regulation is overbroad. Um, the industry won the lawsuit. President Reagan replaced President Carter. He did not appeal the loss and said, okay, back to special efforts. You can do whatever you want. Do it, just do something for elderly and disabled people. Next slide. Meanwhile, New York City has lift equipped buses arriving. Um, because we're, we uh, 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 are about to win our lawsuit. They're going to order buses. They knew we didn't join a purchase. So they started buying lift equipped buses. Next slide. Federal government created minimum standards for paratransit, the kind that appear in the ADA regulation now and in the statute now, but they didn't enforce them. Next slide. Uh, United Spine, <laughs> that's Terry Mokley, who was appeared in the earlier slide. Um, United Spinal became, uh, for lack of a better word, the poster boys for accessible buses when people at MTA wanted to market accessible service, which was rare, but every once in a while they wanted to. Next slide, please. <laughs> 
I only have a couple of minutes, so I have to hurry. Um, the ADA and the slides will all be available to you afterwards. And of course, I can fill in with the background information if you contact me. The ADA transportation provisions were extensive. They were remarkable and they were uh, uh, comp comprehensive. Fixed route buses in transit all had to be accessible. Private over the road bicycles, oh, bicycles, private over the road buses had to be accessible, uh, but not until 96. And it, 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 those are the Greyhound style. Greyhound was particularly resistant to the ADA, threatened to go out of business. Actually, they did go bankrupt and had nothing to do with ADA, but, um, and had to reorganize. But they were per particularly aggressive in opposing the ADA. Key stations on rapid and heavy rail stations, key stations on commuter rail, paratransit, uh, for those who can't use transit until it's accessible, or even when it's accessible, and every Amtrak station by 2010. We know that didn't happen, by the way. Um, next slide, please. When the ADA was introduced, transit operators weren't, they weren't happy about it, but some of them were providing paratransit only, some were putting lifts on buses, some were doing a mix of service, but nobody was providing great service. Um, they, they, some people were providing, like uh, Johnstown, Pennsylvania, lift equipped buses only had the lift working, but many people needed a paratransit supplement to that also. Um, next page, please. The ADA passed, the most, the, the last provisions were the transit ones to be agreed to. Um, to show you where transit opposed the ADA so vehemently that, and transit exists in many democratic cities, mass transit is in cities and urbanized areas and they're democratic congressmen, many of them. And we needed to count on them for passage. And yet the chairman of the transportation committee uh, opposed accessible transportation in the House, a Democrat. The chairman of the, the, the Surface Transportation Subcommittee, Norman Mineta, former mayor of Jose, Schuster was from Pennsylvania, Altoona, I think. Norman Mineta, from former mayor of San Jose, who knew disabled people had lifts on his buses when he was mayor. By 1990, he knew there were lifts on the San Jose buses. He, as the Surface Transit Committee subcommittee chair, supported lifts on buses and fought with the Transportation Committee chair. So this divided even supporters of ADA within the House. But, and here I'm going to invite Dave Capozzi, our next speaker, to chime in. A regulation, once the ADA passed, it's the most specific part of the statute because there were so many injustices worked against people with disabilities during the years preceding ADA when it came to mass transit, that lots of behavior had to be dictated or prohibited. And so the statute is pretty specific, but a regulation needed to be in implemented, um, to promulgate it to rather implement the ADA. And our next speaker, who I'm gonna ask to chime in here, chaired the, the ADA Regulation Writing Committee uh, for U.S. Department of Transportation. Dave, you want to chime in? Sure. Yeah, we had a group of 26 organizations, Eastern Paralyzed Veterans included, um, DREDF, um, ADAPT, um, American Public Transit Association, um, the Transit um, Association from Los Angeles, um, transit from all over the country, disability organizations, and the one thing that I made sure of right from the beginning was to instill cooperation. So I had, I basically had a seating chart and I made sure that um, DREDF and ADAPT were on either side of APTA throughout the meetings. And by the end, they all became friends. Um, and it was, it was wonderful. Um, you know, so it was, it was a good group of people. There were some really interesting um, things that happened during, during the conversations. I, I remember this, you know, the one time when we put up maps of 
um, service areas, and we called them different names like crustaceans and starfishes, and one was a little obscene actually. Um, but it was it was a good group, and it was a good way to write regulations. So thanks, Jim. You're welcome, Dave. And th they made sure that the composition of the committee represented different size transit operators so that the regulation could be uniform, which is very hard to write a, a regulation that fits Missoula, Montana, and New York City, but you had to. And um, um, in 91, uh, the regulation was issued. Um, we've had, uh, next slide, please. Um, we've had 30 years of ADA transportation now. So you've got New York City's rail system, which was the first one to commit to retrofitting itself, being the least accessible rail system in the United States, percentage-wise, of stations. Um, New York City made a deal with the devil. Um, they believed the hype of the American P Public Transit Association and uh, New York City Transit when they were saying it was cheaper to provide paratransit than it was to make mass transit accessible. The joke Jose was referring to when he introduced me was that um, Mayor Koch at a press conference said, it would be cheaper to take everyone with a disability in a limousine than to make the subways and buses accessible, wherever they wanted to go in a limousine than to make the subways and buses accessible. And um, when they told me that at a subsequent press conference that he had said that, what was my response? I said, the mayor talks as if we want the moon, we just want green cheese. And it got on TV on a split screen thing and it was pretty cool. And we started to pick up some steam. Um, the other thing is that uh, when Denise McQuaid, who I pointed out in an earlier slide, blocked buses and when they didn't put her on the bus, one TV reporter captured the police arguing with her and I was there and I said to the police, you should be arresting the bus driver. It's like he's not letting her on the bus because she's black. The same law that protects her under New York state law has a comma between race and disability. And she's just trying to board the bus like everybody else. And he said to me, you sound like you know what you're talking about. Can you?" And we got into this big conversation. It got on TV the right way. Applause. And she was there seven hours till they got the key to operate the lift. United Spinal duplicated the keys, gave them out to all disabled people. So when a bus driver said, I don't have a key, we, they had one. And we, in a de facto way, won the even though we made them by buses with lifts, they wouldn't use them. And in, in, a, in a de facto way, we won that. So now we have 110 or so stations accessible out of 466. Um, we have recently had a transit authority uh, president who was committed to making all of the stations accessible. He left in a dispute with uh, Governor Cuomo, who supported ex supports access. This is Governor Cuomo, Mario Cuomo's son who supports access. So we're hoping to, that when the COVID nightmare is over, we can get that back on track. There's been frequent litigation uh, under ADA over transit. Much of it is around paratransit. The nature of the service is the demand delay response kind of a thing. Um, in those days, 24 hours in advance was reasonable notice because it was state of the art or the day before was state of the art. That's what ADA required on 91. And there's been frequent litigation over all kinds of things surrounding that. Um, next, oh, Amtrak, I mentioned, should have had every station accessible by 2010, and it's still not. Every bus in New York City has been accessible since the 80s. Next stop, a slide, I mean, next stop. Um, this is about taxis. This was a demonstration about taxis. Next slide, please. This was a big, big victory for us. Um, we sued New York City over taxis along with other groups in the New York City disability community. 20 years 
of the Taxis for All campaign work in New York City culminated in 2014 with a settlement agreement that said 50% of New York City's yellow cabs will be accessible by 2020. Lots of problems with that program, including the ride shares, Uber and Lyft and the like, who destroyed the yellow cab business. Um, the yellow cabs were so busy fighting to keep themselves inaccessible, and the New York City Taxi and Limousine Commission was so busy helping them fight us to keep taxis inaccessible that they forgot they had a Russian front. They should have been fighting on another front, which was to keep themselves alive after the onslaught of uh, real-time dispatched uh, Uber-type service, which we now call ride shares or transportation network companies. So the 50% settlement is about 30% now, and the 50% settlement um, is still the law. It's still court enforceable, but we don't want to put taxis out of business completely because they're the workhorse for us now. So we are trying to work out a modified agreement um, to keep the mandate and keep taxis in business. Next slide. Reviews of the taxi program are largely good at this point. Great would be an overstatement, but good would not. And people from out of town who come to New York find it amazing if they use wheelchairs because they just don't have this kind of access. In the near future, well, New York City agreed, we tried to get them to do this at 22,000 um, rideshare vehicles, but they did it at 70,000. They kept uh, Uber type vehicles unless they were accessible. And Uber has agreed to roll out wheelchair accessible vehicle service in 20 American cities during this year. Um, the one in New York is getting pretty good reviews. Um, a lot of it's, it's anecdotal. We need to collect data, we need to review it, but pretty good reviews. The future for paratransit providers, uh, for taxis as paratransit providers is obvious. It's real time and it's cheap. Same thing with regard to Medicaid transportation. Instead of ambulettes, which cost Medicaid a fortune, a taxi could be cheaper. Next slide, please. Further into the future, but even not that far, the whole concept of car ownership and mass transit is gonna change because vehicles will be autonomous. That is, they will be self-driving. We're not just talking about cars, we're talking about buses, trains, planes, ships. Um, the prediction is that it will be safer, where if your feet are firmly in the 20th century, you may not be able to imagine this, but if you skip lightly into the 21st, believe me, you couldn't imagine the internet. And here it is. You can't imagine this, but it will be upon us before you know it. If these vehicles are not accessible, we will be left by the curb again. Our organization is working hard to make them accessible. And I need to uh, yield the time. Yes. <laughs> so so, so um, I'm going to let it go. And Dave, thank you for jumping in. By the way, I do want to say that David Capozzi chaired that group, and it was a rough bunch. These were people, many of them, who had a, the transit operators who had opposed ADA, and his good nature and and uh, Gandhi-like approach to getting this this work done is the reason we have the ADA rig we have now. Um, he really did a yeoman's job, and thank you, Dave, for that. So thank you, Jim. You were good on time. I know you only had a few more slides left, so it worked out. It's great. Um, I do have a couple questions, and please a reminder to people to uh, send in their questions uh, through the comment box on Facebook or over the Q&A section. Um, I'm going to um, share one question that came through for Jim. Um, could you describe the interaction between the Rehab Act, the Architectural Barriers Act, you know, with the ADA, those other, the preceding laws and regulations that were out. I think David should answer that. Sure. That's his expertise. If David would like to address that, that's great too. Sure. Uh, so I, I think the question was, were they all subsumed into the ADA? And, and the answer is no. Uh, 
Um, so each of the pieces of legislation stand on their own. Um, the ADA was built on the backs of the previous legislation and many of the concepts in the ADA were borrowed from the Rehabilitation Act, the Architectural Barriers Act, um, older laws that had been previously passed. Um, for example, airlines are not covered under the ADA because the Air Carrier Access Act was passed uh, a few years before the ADA. So they all stand on their own. They weren't subsumed into the ADA. And one of the reasons why the federal government wasn't covered by the ADA is because the Architectural Barriers Act and Section 504 had already covered um, the federal government. Thank you, David. Excellent. Thank you for that. Another quick question for Jim, and then we'll, we're going to go on to some videos and, and hand, um, go to your formal presentation, David. Uh, but Jim, um, um, the question that came in was, you know, what do you think about the disability rights movement now compared to, you know, 30, 40 years ago when all of this started? What would you like to say about that? It's a great question. Um, I think about it constantly because I'm thinking of retiring and writing a book and, you know, you get very reflective. David, too, I'm sure feels the same way at this point in his career. I know Senator Harkin does. Um, you know, you look at things and you think, well, we've come miles and miles and miles um, in some ways. And then in other ways, you just want to shoot yourself because you're arguing the same things over and over again. So. I would say the disability community itself is a little different. My experience with the disability community started when I was 16. So the Crip, the Crip Camp crowd is kind of the disabled people I hung around with as a teenager. But I didn't realize they were that unusual for disabled people. They were the only disabled people I knew. Um, so when we go in a restaurant or something and somebody would say, don't put him there, I would say he can talk, you know, but I wouldn't think there ought to be a lawyer. I would think what a jerk when th that's all, you know, but, but I would say that it's easier to organize way easier because of the internet. It's easier to talk to each other, to get the word out. It's harder to get heard because of the internet. Everybody's out there and you know, it's, it's hard to get noticed. Um, but we had a press conference once on the day the Pope was shot. And the only person that showed up was the entertainment reporter. Um, so I think it's hard to get noticed all the time in a big city. Um, uh, and there's always a lot going on. And there's a lot of challenges, especially- You know, if you, look, if you look at the Crip Camp Days crowd and what they were saying, um, People are still pretty much saying the same thing. The mantra of the disability rights movement, let's say nothing about us without us or something like that, that's 45 years old, whether they knew it or not. That was what it was all about. And getting access to employment has always been a civil rights goal for every group. So it still is. Unfortunately, it's not that great. And, and, uh, I think transportation galvanized people with disabilities and made them stronger, the fight, and it organized them and they were ready to do the ADA. And I thought maybe, and maybe it has, the Affordable Care Act and the repeal of the Affordable Care Act um, and the disability community's efforts to fight the repeal show you that we can get out there and do it again. And we, okay. we have to keep doing it. That one exquisite push in 1990, we have to keep that effort up. That did happen to stop the Affordable Care Act repeal. Yep. I mean, it, was just, it wasn't forward, it was just to keep where we were, but we have done it again and we have to keep doing things like that. Yep, absolutely agree. Thank you, Jim. Um, let's, thank you so much. Let's go to, um, we're gonna show a quick video of a New York advocate. Um, we've been collecting these across our network. And then we're going to play the second piece of our ADA 30 a video. And then we'll have two of our Iowa advocates introduce um, a special video that we'll be showing. Thank you. <laughs> 
What's up guys, this is Wesley Hamilton, Executive Director of Disabled But Not Really. Um, I'm over here at Parks and Rec, been doing this amazing initiative, really talking about the ADA at KC Parks. And we've been doing this every week on Tuesdays on Facebook Live, really encouraging people with disabilities to come out and of course having me go out and try it first to let you know where the challenges are, where the parking is, and act, and how you can come out and be active. So again, guys, ADA is very, very important. It should be something that is put on the forefront of anything that you're building or doing. And I just, it's an honor to come out and show other people that are like myself that there are places like this that are ADA accessible. With its roots in New York City, United Spinal began to focus on a variety of problems facing the disability community. It played an instrumental role in improving the city's mass transit systems and developed programs to make the built environment accessible to all. New York City is our showroom. Uh, Frank Sinatra, you know, if you can make it here, you can make it anywhere. What we've done here, many times the first time in the world, shows that it can be done anywhere. We took an old rail city and got them to agree to make transportation accessible. In 1979, we sued New York City Transit to make buses and subways accessible. No one agreed. The litigation went on for a couple of few years. We got an injunction to stop subway station renovation unless they made them accessible. We did it. 50% of taxis had to be accessible by 2020, an agreement we made in 2014 that would change the face of transportation in New York City. United Spinal was called upon to help draft portions of the Americans with Disabilities Act. This landmark civil rights law prohibits discrimination based upon disability. If you ask me what's the most significant thing I've ever done, I would say participating in the, there's two, there's a tie. Participating in the drafting of the Americans with Disabilities Act, because I never dreamed of something like that and getting New York City to agree to put lifts on buses. So I got involved with the national group that was lobbying for ADA, and it was an exquisite coming together of people who were of one mind about the needs and rights issues, and 22 months start to finish from concept to statute. I don't think I've ever done anything better or faster with greater people and uh, we're about to have the 30th anniversary. Um, and then, yes, so, so thank you. That's, that's th that section. And we're gonna go hand it over to my lovely colleagues from Iowa, Jennifer Wolf and Angie Holsebus. Hey everyone, I'm so excited to be here today. Um, I am Angie Holsebus, I am the current president for the Iowa chapter of United Spinal, and I am excited to help introduce our next guest. I was honored to meet um, Senator Tom Harkin in 2009 when I was Miss Wilshire, Iowa. Uh, we, all of us, not in Iowa, in the whole entire country, all of us, um, we do really appreciate all of his lifelong work um, across the country, not just in Iowa. Um, for disability rights and helping all individuals access life in general. I was thinking about this being the 30th anniversary of the ADA. I was seven, um, so I don't really know how it was before. Um, and I've been in a chair user for 16 years, um, but just the amount of change that has happened in those 16 years, it just keeps getting better and better as we advocate for others and ourselves. Um, so that leads me to introduce my colleague, Jen, to tell us more about Senator Harkin and advocacy. I'm Jen Wolf. Thanks, Angie, I have to say that. Um, I'm Jen Wolf and a disabled occupational therapist from Waverly, Iowa. And 
I am so proud to, to inter, you know, be part of this introduction. Um, in 2012, at our very first legislative and advocacy conference, Roll on Capitol Hill, it was truly an honor to help recognize Senator Tom Harkin as the inaugural Senate recipient of the United Spinals Disability Champion Award. It's one of my favorite pictures. Um, the Senator retired in 2015, but not really. Um, that same year, he started the Harkin Institute for Public Policy and Civic Engagement at Drake University in Des Moines, Iowa, where he continues to impact policy work. He's always on the move, attending meetings like the Zero Project Conference in, uh, Vienna, in Vienna, which focuses on the rights of people with disabilities globally and still has time to be on Zoom call um, and, and does videos and all these different things for the disability community. As fellow Iowans, we are extremely proud to introduce Iowa's former Senator and ongoing disability rights champion, Tom Harkin. Hi, I'm retired Tom Harkin. On July the 26th of this year, our country is celebrating 30 years of commitment to creating equal opportunities for individuals living with disabilities through the passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act, the ADA. A lot of times people ask me, uh, what was my motivation for sponsoring the Americans with Disabilities Act? Well, I grew up with a brother, my brother Frank, who became deaf at around between five and six years of age. He was taken from his home, uh, sent halfway across the state uh, to a school for the deaf, and, and it was called the school for the deaf and dumb in those days. Because my brother once said to me, I may be deaf, but I'm not dumb. But that's, that's the kind of hurtful language that, that people used. And then I saw later on in life how he was discriminated against in so many ways, simply because he was deaf. And so I thought, well, if I ever had a chance to do something about it, I would. For a person with a disability, it was a life of segregation and separation from their family and their friends, their community. It was a life of hurtful language that you would hear all the time. And it was a life, even among the most well-meaning of people, it was a life of pity and patronizing attitudes. Life was limiting in so many ways to a person with a disability before the ADA. A lot of times people ask me, you know, who were, who were your partners in getting this done? Well, the biggest force really behind the ADA were persons with disabilities. In the late 70s and 80s, they would start laying down behind the wheels, under the wheels of Greyhound buses because they couldn't get on a bus. There was the famous Capitol crawl when people fell out of their wheelchairs and crawled up the steps of the U.S. Capitol because that was the only way they could get in. Uh, to illustrate, they were just this creative nonviolence uh, that they engaged in brought to the conscience of America that things needed to change. And this all came to a head in the late 80s when I was in the Senate. And uh, we had bipartisan support. This was a bipartisan effort. I remember when the bill passed the Senate floor. Uh, being the chief sponsor, I was leading the effort on the Senate floor. And I gave my speech in sign language. And uh, I remember this caused quite a stir on the Senate floor because as you know, there's a reporter that takes down everything that's said on the Senate floor. Well, the reporter didn't understand sign language. The Senator sitting in the chair uh, that was uh, in charge of the Senate floor was Senator Bob Kerry from Nebraska. He didn't know what to do either <laughs> because he didn't understand sign language. So I remarked, well, now you know what a deaf person feels like when all they see are verbal communications and they can't understand verbal communications. Uh, but I had to go back and give my speech verbally also. But I think, I, I hope it brought home to people kind of what, 
we're talking about, and that is accessibility. You see, there are four goals of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Full participation, equal opportunity, independent living, and economic self-sufficiency. So in 30 years, we kind of look back and think, well, how have we done? Well, on the first three, we've made some progress. We have more participation in all aspects of society uh, by persons with disabilities, and especially by what I call the ADA generation. The ADA generation, uh, those with disabilities born after 1990, has grown up under the ADA, where access and inclusion are the norm, not an exception. These children and young adults and their parents expect to have integrated classrooms, to be cared for by local doctors and to be hired without discrimination. It's no longer enough to rise to the level of accommodation outlined in the ADA. Accommodations are the minimum. We're now in an age where full inclusion is expected. But it's in that last goal, economic self-sufficiency, where we really have not kept up and we haven't made much advance. When I retired from the Senate, I decided to focus my energies and efforts in that area. And to that end, we have started what's called Harkin Summits. And you can look it up, harkinsummit.org. The goal of those is simply to get the private sector to commit to doing more. In 2017, I challenged the broad private sector to set a goal that in the next 10 years, they would double the rate of employment of persons with disabilities. Whether you are a small business hardware store, a dry cleaner or ice cream shop, pledge to hire your first employee with a disability. If you already employ a worker with a disability, pledge to double the number and to consider advancement for your current employees with disabilities. If you are a big business uh, like uh, American Airlines or Microsoft or, uh, or Home Depot, you should have an aggressive hiring plan to recruit, hire, train, retain, and advance workers with disabilities. And finally, I encourage you to work with this new young ADA generation. They are a marvel to behold. They're smart, they're engaged, and they're ready to make the world their own. Small changes by those on Main Street and big changes by those on Wall Street can make the goal of economic self-sufficiency for people with disabilities a reality. Make that pledge now on behalf of the 30th anniversary of the ADA. If we all do this, then 30 years from now, we can say with pride that everyone in America, every person with a disability has access to the same rights, the same dreams, and the same opportunities as everyone else to make those dreams come true. That's great. That's great. And unfortunately, you know, Senator Harkin wasn't able to join us um, in, in person or virtually in person, but he apologizes and um, we hope to schedule a conversation with him later on, which will be great, which we'll share with everyone. Um, over to our wonderful advocate from Maryland, Chanel Wimbish, who's going to introduce our next wonderful speaker. Chanel. Thanks, Alex. Hello everyone, my name is Chanel Wimbish and I live in College Park, Maryland and I am a member of the DC chapter of the United Spinal Association. As a lifelong swimmer, I am so very grateful for the Americans with Disabilities Act or the ADA. When I was first injured close to 11 years ago, I couldn't wait to get back into the pool. However, when I joined the local master swim team named L Lane 4 Swimming, here in Maryland, the pool only had a non-ADA compliant manual crank lift that required someone else to work the lift in order for me to get in and out of the pool. And most times the lift didn't even work, which meant I then had to transfer to the ground from my wheelchair in order to get into the pool and pull myself 
out of the pool to get to the floor in order to transfer to my wheelchair after practice. And thanks to the ADA, I was able to successfully advocate for the installation of an ADA compliant lift that I can use independently to get in and out of the pool and practice with my, with my teammates. As a part of this ADA 30 celebration, I'm honored to introduce our next presenter, David M. Capozzi from Gaithersburg, Maryland, which is just up the road from where I am. David was the executive director of the US Access Board, the only federal agency whose primary mission is accessibility for people with disabilities. He recently retired in June, and we are so lucky to have him join our board of directors this month. Kaposi has over 35 years of experience directing programs focused on national accessibility policies in the federal and nonprofit sectors. He was a member of a nine person legal team that helped craft sections of the Americans with Disabilities Act, the civil rights law that prohibits discrimination against individuals with disabilities. While at the Access Board, Kaposi managed complex rulemakings, regulatory assessments, contracts, grants, and cooperative agreements. He was also responsible for the Access Board's Architectural Barriers Act Enforcement Program. Kaposi holds a bachelor's degree in psychology from the University of Buffalo and a law degree from the University of Buffalo School of Law. David, welcome. Thank you very much, Chanel. It's good to be with everybody. Um, before I start, I would be remiss if I didn't um, highlight one of our participants today. I noticed that Katie Bay Neese is um, one of the participants. And uh, we just saw the video of Senator Tom Harkin. Katie uh, worked for Senator Harkin during the development of the ADA. And her husband, uh, Ralph Neese, was one of the principal people that moved the ADA. He was executive director of the Leadership Conference on Civil Rights at the time. Uh, and I just wanted to say hello to Katie and um, congratulations to you and to, to Ralph for all of the work that you've done over the years. So I wanna build on um, some of the things that you've heard already from Jose, um, from Jim, um, even from Chanel. Um, and I wanna talk about some of the progress that, that we've seen. So I've been using a wheelchair for 43 years and in those years of using a wheelchair, I've witnessed a lot of progress in accessibility and have seen an evolution in technology. And so I'd like to share some stories about progress and evolution in access that have been made through compliance with laws, regulations, and standards. Next slide, please. Some of the laws passed by Congress over the years that impact accessibility include the Architectural Barriers Act, Jim talked about that, it applies to federal buildings, the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, and some revisions made in 1998 for technology and 2010 for medical diagnostic equipment, the Air Carrier Access Act, the Uniform System for Handicapped Parking, the Fair Housing uh, Amendments Act, the ADA, which is what we're here to talk about today, and the Telecommunications Act. Next slide, please. In the U.S., the first accessibility standard was the ANSI A117.1 standard issued in 1961. It contained six pages of requirements and it had only two figures. Next slide. The current ADA and Architectural Barriers Act accessibility guidelines contains 251 pages of requirements and has 141 figures. It now addresses recreation facilities, including pools, play areas, golf, miniature golf, boating and fishing facilities, amusement rides, courthouses, and prisons. Next slide, please. Since the first accessibility standard in 1961, we've seen the widespread installation of curb ramps, high-low drinking fountains, playgrounds, and accessibility and accessible technology and communication devices. Next slide, please. 
The first curb ramps were installed in Kalamazoo, Michigan in 1945 by returning World War II veterans. In Urbana, Illinois in 1952, curb ramps were installed for students at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And in Berkeley, California, home of the disability rights and independent living movement, the first curb ramp was installed in 1972. Next slide, please. Today's modern curb ramps are easier to use, better designed, and have detectable warnings and audible pedestrian signals. Next slide. High-low drinking fountains introduced in 1991 with the ADA accessibility guidelines are now the norm. On the left is an adapted drinking fountain from the 1950s, and on the right is a standard high-low drinking fountain from a manufacturer's catalog. Next slide. Playgrounds have changed remarkably. On the left is the 1950s playground with inaccessible equipment and grass surfacing, and on the right is an inclusive playground with accessible equipment and poured in place rubberized surfacing made possible by new requirements issued in 2000. Next slide. Progress can also be seen in the great outdoors. There's now requirements for beach access routes and accessible trails in federal facilities. Next slide. We've seen a revolution in accessible technology and communication devices in the built environment as well. September 1969 saw America's first ATM at a bank in New York. It was completely inaccessible. Next slide. The ADA um, accessibility guidelines in 1991 only had a performance standard that required ATMs to have instructions and information to make the AT ATM independently usable by people with vision impairments. And the provision was so vague that ATMs were found with large placards of braille instructions, but with no change to the operating system, the machines were unusable. A court decision held that because the guidelines were so vague and nonspecific, speech output couldn't be required. So finally, in 2004, the guidelines were revised to require that at least one of each type of ATM be speech enabled. And by 2012, there were over 100,000 ATMs in the US with speech output. The first long distance TTY call was placed in May 1964. Today, video phones are the preferred method of communication by people who are deaf. Next slide. With the adoption of the personal computer and DOS-based programs in the early 1980s, if some of you can remember about DOS, screen reader technology developed and opened a new world of equal access to the written word for blind people. But then in 1984, a unique way of computer interaction became widely available, the graphical user interface, which we all use today. People use the mouse or other pointing device and icons to navigate software programs. While an amazing advancement for sighted users, this new interface was totally inaccessible to blind people. Next slide. Then in 1992, the first screen reader for a graphical user interface operating system became available. But those eight years between the innovation of graphical user interfaces in 1984 and the creation of screen readers that could work with them in 1992 left many blind computer users behind. Next slide. Today, there are accessibility standards called the Section 508 standards that should make this technological disconnect harder to happen. Although Section 508 only applies to the US federal government, its impact has been felt around the world. The European Union now has a new set of technology accessibility standards modeled after updated Section 508 standards. And Australia and Canada are also using public procurement to drive accessible technology. Substantial progress has been made in making products such as copier machines more accessible. Software and operating systems have, been, uh, have included accessibility features and federal websites are more accessible today. Next slide, please. 
Martin Cooper invented the cell phone in 1973, opening telecommunications for millions while leaving millions more behind since early phones were not hearing aid compatible and even more were left behind when touch screens were first introduced. Completely inaccessible. Now the iPhone is largely preferred by blind users because of its voiceover capabilities and by people who use hearing aids because of its hearing aid compatibility. Next slide, please. A new form of technology, real-time text is here and may ultimately re replace older TTYs. Shown here are examples of real-time text solutions from Apple and AT&T that are in use today. Next slide. Accessible technology has also meant increased mobility for people with physical disabilities. George Klein, a Canadian, is credited with designing the power wheelchair in the early 1950s. Today's chairs are a bit more contemporary. Led by the ADA and its regulations and transportation vehicle guidelines, we've seen even more remarkable progress in accessible transportation. Next slide, please. Walter Callow, a Canadian blind quadriplegic veteran, invented the first wheelchair accessible bus in 1947, shown on the left. And in 1952, we saw the first accessible fixed route bus system at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Mr. Callow took his first and only ride in the accessible bus after his death when his body was transported for his funeral. Next slide, please. <laughs> Transportation accessibility was improved through civil disobedience too, as Jim mentioned. A group of advocates um, who brought attention to civil rights for people with disabilities called ADAPT got its start in Denver, Colorado in 1983 when they protested over inaccessible buses. When ADAPT was successful in getting accessible transportation required through the ADA, they changed their name from Americans Disabled for Accessible Public Transit to Americans Disabled for Attendant Programs today. Next slide, please. So let me show you some of the real effects of laws, regulations, and standards on transportation in the US. This slide shows the effects of the ADA on the percentage of accessible vehicles. In 1989, the year before the ADA was passed, 40% of fixed route buses in the United States were accessible. As of last year, 100% were. Next slide, please. Buses and trains may be becoming more accessible, but getting to and from bus stops and train stations remains challenging in some communities. Stops may lack level pads, Shelters may lack clear floor space for people who use wheelchairs, and sidewalks might not be level, or a lack of curb ramps can prevent those with mobility issues from navigating them. As a result, advocates have turned to the courts in cities around the country. Next, step, next slide, please. Many barriers still exist at rail stations because of a lack of level boarding. These photos show Amtrak's new retractable setback shuttle platform for high level platforms that's installed at a station in Ann Arbor, Michigan, but it's the only one in the country. Next slide. Many tools are used to accelerate progress and accessibility. One is how we describe and promote accessibility through symbols. The international symbol of accessibility was created by a Danish student in 1969 and modified shortly thereafter by adding a circle to the top of the seated figure by Rehabilitation International's International Commission for Technical Aids. Today, uh, next slide please. Today there's a movement to redesign the symbol. On the left is a new symbol de developed by the Accessible Icon Project and embraced by laws in New York. Connecticut and Tennessee and several local jurisdictions. And on the right is one of the designs from a contest launched a few years ago by the Lieutenant Governor of Ontario and the Ontario College of Art and Design University. 
It hasn't been embraced so warmly though. Next slide, please. In the mid 1950s, the Rehabilitation Education Center at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign engaged in research on ramp slope and materials. Research was conducted on the ramp that led to nowhere. It was adjustable to heights up to one story and researchers changed its slope and length by lowering the ramp and pounding pegs and pre-drilled holes in the vertical posts. About 75 students in wheelchairs were tested using this ramp. Next slide, please. Today's research is a little bit more robust. The IDEA Center at State University of New York at Buffalo conducted one of the world's most robust accessibility research projects in recent memory. Researchers collected and analyzed data from almost 500 individuals who used wheeled mobility devices and compared their findings to those in three other countries and to the current standards in those countries and the US. Next slide, please. And progress can also be seen in awareness raising. In Buffalo, New York, there's a Museum of Disability History. Next slide. In Washington, at the National Museum of American History, there's an online museum called Everybody, an Artifact History of Disability in America. Next slide and another celebrating the first 25 years of the Americans with Disabilities Act. But despite all this progress we've seen over the years, challenges remain. And one persistent challenge is our inner city rail system. Next slide. Amtrak has either sole or shared ADA responsibility at 388 stations in the US. In 2014, Amtrak's Inspector General released an audit report finding that only 51 stations Amtrak served were ADA compliant. And in 2015, the Department of Justice issued a finding that Amtrak has failed to comply with the ADA and its regulations. And as Jim mentioned, all Amtrak stations were required to be made accessible by 2010. New challenges also exist with areas that are not regulated well. And as we've seen in the past, the rush to advance technology has the potential to leave people behind. Next slide. We're seeing that today with the challenges to making electronic instructional materials accessible to students. Next slide. And the advent of inaccessible touchscreens. We haven't progressed much in 30 years in terms of providing accessible taxis either. Next slide. Most people with disabilities still need to call in advance for the few accessible taxis that exist. And going outside and expecting to hail an accessible taxi in most cities is simply not possible. But in London, England, metropolitan legislation has required all new taxis to be wheelchair accessible since 1989. Uber and Lyft have been sued in New York, California, Illinois, Pennsylvania, and Texas, challenging the ride sharing's failure to make wheelchair accessible vehicles available through their ride share services. Next slide. And autonomous vehicles are being developed, many with accessibility and the need for independent wheelchair securement as an afterthought. Next slide. Many of us have benefited from the provision of accessible parking spaces made possible by the ADA accessibility standards. But as most of you know, abuse of accessible parking is widespread. To deter accessible placard and license plate abuse, the International Parking and Mobility Institute created the Accessible Parking Coalition. And the coalition conducted the first national survey of over 4,000 individuals with disabilities and the most significant problem reported were drivers without disabilities who park illegally in inaccessible parking spots, inaccessible parking spots, or obstruct, or obstruct access by parking too close to a vehicle, as shown here, making it impossible for drivers with disabilities to exit or enter their vehicles. About 80% of respondents believe accessible parking fraud 
and placard abuse is widespread and even more believe law enforcement of accessible parking regulations is inadequate or non-existent. Next slide, please. The Access Board is undertaking a study that has the potential to advance access to air travel for people who use wheelchairs. The project is assessing the feasibility of equipping passenger planes with securement systems so that passengers can remain in their wheelchairs on flights. Having to transfer out of wheelchairs makes air travel difficult, if not impossible, for many people with disabilities. Next slide, please. Other challenges remain, such as access to exercise equipment. Next slide. And the need for more accessible medical diagnostic equipment. Next slide. And accessible prescription drug labels. Next slide. And access into single family housing um, remains a challenge as well. Next slide. So despite all this progress we've seen over the years, we still have a lot more work to do. And that's why we need advocates to help enforce the laws and regulations that have been fought for for so long and to help prevent new barriers from occurring. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dave. That's great. A lot of good information. Um, I do have a question This to really go for go to both of you, um, David or Jim. Um, let me just read the question again. Asking about foreseeing any um, additional Olmstead litigation in the future. Um, if there's anything on, on that topic you'd like to address, it's a broad issue and not specifically addressed here, but um, Olmstead for those on the call, obviously what legislation the Supreme Court announced in 99, where it was discriminatory under the EPA to um, segregate people from community in, uh, integrated living. So um, Dave or Jim, if you'd like to say anything about the Olmstead issue and uh, take yourselves off mute when you're talking. <laughs> Sorry, right before the COVID mess hit New York uh, in early March, we were working with a firm to bring a nationwide class action regarding personal care attendant services using Olmstead. Um, we're trying to uh, reassess after the personal care crisis caused by COVID where we are in regard to that. But the theory would be that Olmstead uh, re requires uh, requires you to provide setting, uh, services in the most integrated setting appropriate to people with disabilities needs. And um, if you're providing, if you're forcing people into Medicaid funded nursing homes, you are not because your personal care attendant program is inadequate for any reason. You're not obeying Olmstead. You're not providing it in the most integrated setting. So I'm hoping to work with the uh, with advocates around the country when we when this crisis is over, as well as the National Domestic Workers Alliance, the organization of personal care tenants, uh, uh, to, to get this done and use Olmstead that way. Great. Hey, Thank Jim, you, Jim. I just wanted to add that that question was asked by Katie Carroll from um, the Independent of Upstate. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I do want to have a time check, so we do have a few things, uh, additional things we'd like to address here. Uh, we're going to show the last section of our ADA anniversary video and then a piece from one of our advocates from Louisiana again. United Spinal has used the ADA to not only advocate for improvements in transportation, employment, and accessibility, but to promote the integration of people with disabilities in all aspects of our society. When United Spinal became United Spinal, when it decided to open its doors to everyone with spinal cord injury and disorder, we had to change our priorities. It was gonna still represent disabled veterans, but it's also going to deal with disability policy nationally. It's also going to organize chapters around the country to deal with disability policy locally. And it's also going to 
speak directly to the community of manufacturers and vendors of equipment for people with disabilities. United Spinal Association sees as part of its mission developing the next generation of leadership. There was a core group of disability advocates that existed in the late 70s, early 80s that pushed the disability rights movement over the finish line if the finish line was the Americans with Disabilities Act. And there have been great leaps and bounds in promoting the rights of people with disabilities since the Americans with Disabilities Act, largely because it passed. But it is imperative to develop that next generation of leader. United Spinal's initiatives have paved the way for future generations of people with disabilities to live with a greater quality of life and independence. So I went on to uh, finish my undergrad, my master's degree and raise three kids and I've been employed the entire time and it was not okay anymore for people to discriminate against you because you couldn't walk. And I've lived a really full and active life. There's been a lot of, a lot of positive change in the last 30 years and, and there's going to be more in the future and I hope to be one of those advocates that helps to pave the way for other people with disabilities in the next 30 years and we improve access. and and eliminate the stigma and, and there's more inclusion in general for people with all different types of disabilities. So I just wanted to say a big happy birthday to the Americans with Disabilities Act. And as we say from Louisiana, les les bon temps roulé, which means let the good times roll. Bye y'all. So um, yes, um, lots of good information, lots of great advocacy. Um, we do have a little bit of time for questions, uh, so I want to make sure we, we do that. There's a couple more that I'd like to address, but why don't we also thank our sponsors again. Um, Angel, if you could, could do that, and I wanted to uh, announce um, the winner of our um, Alaska Airline drawing. So we're going to do that in a second. Um, um, Angel will, uh, will randomly select a participant in a second, but thank you. Uh, I have these sponsors up there. Let me go to the questions now and um, we'll announce shortly. So some really good questions that came in. Um, let's see, some, some, an individual asks about, you know, what are the other strong advocates out there disability rights um, in, on the Hill, and I'm happy to answer that. There's a lot of leaders in the in disability world uh, on the Hill that we've been working with closely. Um, some of you have heard of some of them. Um, some may be as not as well known, but want them to be more well known. So Senator Casey of Pennsylvania, many of you have heard of him. Um, Congresswoman Holland from New Mexico was a, a new congressman. Who, great great work and support of the disability community. There's also Congressman Langevin from Rhode Island, who we work very closely with. He's been in the Congress for a while um, from Rhode Island. Um, and um, there's also um, uh, Senator Hassan from New Hampshire, Senator Murray uh, from Washington State, who is um, very supportive of veterans issues as well. And of course, is Senator Duckworth out Illinois that many of you heard. So there are others, there are new, newer names out there. Um, why did I go to um, uh, ask uh, David Kaposi one other question uh, related to the access board? Uh, this individual asks about regulations about self-driving vehicles um, from the access board perspective. Um, you mentioned that a little bit in your presentation, David, and I know you, you know Spinal has been working on that a lot, obviously. But if there's anything you'd like to address in that capacity, go for it. Right. So the question was, have we seen anything on proposed regulations regarding self-driving vehicles? Um, 
regulations, no. So there was uh, right when the new administration came in, or not so new administration now, came in, they issued an executive order saying that for every one regulation that you issue, you have to remove two existing regulations uh, that match the um, amount of the one regulation that you're planning to to issue. Mm -hmm. So there's been so there's been a lot of um, regulations that um, would like to have been issued, but have not been because of that two for one. What I can say is is that in the last last year's Senate appropriations bill, there was language directing um, both the um, Federal Motor Vehicle, uh, um, NHTSA, to look at the Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standards, along with the Access Board, to determine whether there were any gaps in coverage in the Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standards that needed to be addressed. And that report is due in September from DOT and the Access Board. And then secondly, um, right before I left, we started a, um, a planned project to develop voluntary guidance on um, autonomous vehicles with DOT, Department of Labor, and Department of Justice um, to help at least provide some guidance to manufacturers that are making autonomous vehicles. So, Regulations, no, but maybe some guidance coming out. Great. Thank you, David. Um, so, yes, right on time. We have two, a little a minute shy of um, uh, our time. So, Andrew Bristol um, is the lucky winner of two round trip Alaska Airlines tickets. And, Andrew, if you could email uh, me at this email that I'm putting in the chat, advocacy at unitedspinal.org. Advocacy at unitedspinal.org. Please send me, Andrew Bistrel, your information so that we can connect with you um, and send you the tickets, um, contact information, okay? So thanks. So um, I see what organizations around the country is United Spinal Connect with. A lot of organizations. <laughs> Too, too many to, to list here, but we have a great board of directors and Jim and all of our staff here that have some great connections uh, with all different sectors that we represent for the disability community. So if you'd like some more information about that, happy to, to I, ask I, that. And if Jim would, and if you, you can email applicacy at unitedspinal.org and Jim, please, if there's anything else you'd like to say. Well, on I that. just wanted to say the organizations that we're connected with, are, 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 are so varied because our, our scope is so wide. But when it comes to people with disabilities, the organizations we're connected with are also through, the, through um, Washington, there's hundreds of them, but we're part of the National Disability Leadership Alliance, which I just wanted to mention. It's 17 organizations that are disability led, it's boards of directors, are people with disabilities, they employ people with disabilities, their goals are of, for, and by people with disabilities. And uh, it's a, a very genuine voice of people with disabilities when they speak together as a group, because there's no government involvement, there's no provider organization involvement, there's not even any parental involvement. Not that there's anything wrong with parents, parents are the best advocates in the world, but this is, these are self-advocacy groups for the most part and, and membership organizations. So I, I thought we should let you know they exist and that we speak to each other that way. Great, thank you, Jim. Um, just one quick question that somebody had about CRT and I'm happy to answer that. So this, we've always been advocating for better access to customized wheelchairs. Um, there's a, um, a bill currently um, that we're going to reintroduce in the new Congress for a separate, ben a separate benefit category. Um, but there's also additional regulation that we're looking at uh, ensuring that seat elevation and standing features get covered under Medicare because currently it's, it, it's not considered medically required, which is insane. So we'll continue to share updates on CRT, but there was a question that came in on that. I'm happy to 
uh, post that on our website with, with more, more information. Um, so that's all we have. Um, so thank well, you for- I want to thank you, Alex, for pulling this all together. I want to thank Angel for all of his uh, IT work to make this possible. And of course, everyone who tuned in. David, you're the best. Uh, we, we have a resource, the resource of resource. This is the go-to person. Um, and we can go to him now that he's out of uh, the federal government. We have a go-to guy on the outside, um, which is wonderful. And Alex, thank you so much for all your work on this event. And everyone who called in, thank you too. Thank you. And if, if we didn't get your question, please email me at advocacy at unitedspinal.org. I put that in the chat. It's easy to remember, advocacy at unitedspinal.org. Thanks so much. We'll put the recording on the website and we'll send the link out to everyone who registered. Um, happy anniversary to the ADA. Bye everyone. Thank you.